The next session that we are going to move into will be a panel discussion from a very wide range, a very interesting range of presenters. To facilitate the panel discussion, we will have Rochelle Cameron from FLO, VP of Legal and Regulatory Jamaica, Cayman, Trinidad and Tobago. Please make your way forward and I'm going to invite our panelists as well to come to the stage and have a seat. Uh, starting with Dr. Uh, where am I? Okay. Starting with Dr. Hopelin Hines. We also have on this panel Dr. Carvel McCleary, Dr. Sophia Morgan, and Dr. Clement Branch. And there's an observation I've made. I have not said it, but it's on your, your magazine that our primary, our, our main sponsor is the University of the West Indies, uh, supported by the Ministry of Industry, Commerce, and Agriculture and Fisheries. But I think there is a little thing going on because all of these distinguished presenters are all graduates of the University of the West Indies also. <laughs> and, and I must also claim that I'm a part of that crew <laughs> as well. So we have everyone here. And that, just to give you a, a quick overview, you have it in your magazines, but Dr. Hopelin Hines is the Director of Total Rewards and Evaluations with Scotiabank Group in Jamaica Limited. She also uh, did her, has her doctorate in philosophy in organizational behavior, which she also got from the University of West Indies. And the focal point of her studies was examining the influence of leadership engagement on employee engagement and performance in an organizational setting. So she has great background for this conference. We have also Dr. Carvel Newton McCleary, who is Senior Director of HRM and A at Airports Authority of Jamaica. And Dr. McCleary also got his PhD from the University of West Indies, and he has spent most of his career in HR, and also has a very strong entrepreneurial spirit, a fascination with the aviation business. That is very interesting. And is a student of strat strategy as well, I'm noticing here. Dr. Sophia Morgan actually taught me at university. She probably don't remember. <laughs> yes, but yes, I did, uh, I think, one or, two, one or two courses with you. Uh, she is a lecturer at the UA still and an organizational consultant who studied at university and still also lectures there. Dr. Morgan's mission is to motivate and inspire her students to become the best versions of themselves. And I can confess that is true. She's always had that spirit. Uh, Dr. Clement Branch is a stalwart in sociology. And, social, and the social um, sector, section of academia. He's uh, the coordinator of human resource development of the graduate programs at the University of West Indies, Mona, and his work is prolific. He's an avid publisher and speaker in various forums in Jamaica. So now, please, I hand over to Rochelle. Good morning, all. Morning all. <laughs> At least make we be engaged. <laughs> so morning everybody. Um, it is so fantastic to see so many people out here today. I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces. Hi Naomi, hi Renee. <laughs> a lot of familiar faces as we're here to discuss such an important topic for us here in Jamaica, employee engagement. I too am a graduate of the University of the West Indies, so we should probably have that hashtag too, hashtag all away we go UA. <laughs> so we've heard some introductions for our speakers this morning and we're actually going to jump into the presentation. You know, this particular era we're looking at the nuances of employee engagement and productivity in Jamaica and not just some ordinary research findings but some groundbreaking research findings and we really have an amazing group of presenters this morning and um, the order of the presentations we will actually start with Mr. Clement Branch and then we will have Miss Morgan 
And we'll move into Dr. McCleary and then Dr. Hines. From some of the earlier questions that were rather searching, we know that the research will certainly be questioned and we'll have some vigorous debate. We'll hopefully have the debate using um, the technology, but if not, thank God for the ordinary little mics. So ladies and gentlemen, let us at this time welcome Mr. Clement Branch, Coordinator, HRD Graduate Programs Unit of the University of the West Indies. Good morning, everyone. It's goodish to be here. I have 10 minutes, and uh, we are going to go through fairly quickly. My title is Plantation, Transgression, and Displacement, a Caribbean Organizational Imaginary. And this is a paper that I am presenting, but there are really two authors, myself and uh, Olivine Thomas. I'm going to start with two quotations, one about the past and one about the present. First, the quotation about the past. In the Caribbean, the European imperial en enterprise ensured that the worst features of colonialism throughout the globe would all be combined in the region. The virtual annihilation of the native population, the plundering and internecine piracy among the European powers, the deracination and atrocities of the slave trade and plantation slavery, and the subsequent system of indenture which stranded Chinese and Indians in the Caribbean when the return clauses of indenture contracts were dishonored. So that is the history, that is the past. The next quotation is about the present. And it is from a young St. Lucian poet, Vladimir Lucian. And the quotation, it never ends. People slide easily into stretchers every day. Belly laugh their way out of breath. Lives wrapped in a a roti of debt. What we're trying to do is to connect the past to the present. And we are trying to place the question of engagement within the context of Caribbean history. You will see from what follows that is from the panelists, that we think of organizational engagement and productivity in the broadest of terms, terms that require a radical reordering of relations of power within the individual psyche and outside of the, of the individual, both within organizations and outside of organizations. The Department of Sociology, Psychology, and Social Work at MONA has produced in the last half dozen years a number of PhD theses focusing on the dynamics of Jamaican Caribbean organizations. These have studied defensiveness, engagement, trust, and identity. From these different studies, there are three points to be made. One, all the phenomena studied are interrelated. They overlap and they are mutually interactive. Two, they all are suggestive of substantial structural embeddedness that require transformation, but at the same time, that make transformation difficult. 
Thirdly, all of these studies are part of a larger project that places the study of Caribbean and Caribbean organization within a post-colonial framework. Just to orient the audience, we will give two suggestions as to what a co post-colonial framework is about. One, it has been suggested that it is more helpful to think of post-colonialism, not just as coming literally after colonialism and signifying its demise, but more flexibly as the contestation of colonial domination and the legacies of colonialism. The second suggestion is that the post-colonials signify not as much subjectivity after the colonial experience as a subjectivity of oppositionality to imperializing, colonializing, red, subordinating, subjectivizing discourses and practices. So that's the the general framework in which our study of organizations and engagement and related phenomena takes place. In the reality of Caribbean social structure from the establishment of plantation society to the present, the phenomenon of transgression has been fundamental. We define transgression in the following terms. One, transgression is a liminal strategy of contestation, of appropriation, subversion, and transformation in a context of domination and inequality. Two, transgression is an oppositional process, structure, location, or attitude established in relations of domination, exclusion, and felt denial. The plantation has been used to describe our reality. We talk about plantation society. But the plantation is a historical reality and a metaphor. But it's a metaphor that we still live by in many organizational and everyday contexts today. Organizational transformation has been slow unlimited, but in understanding that, we must remember that the new world plantations involve an alignment of an organizational form and ethic with the logic, rational, technical, and cultural of modern imperialism, colonialism, and capitalism. All attempts at social and organizational Transformation, therefore, have to take account of ongoing transgressive structures against a continually consolidating and interlocking system of power relations at many psychosociocultural levels. The, the Caribbean has produced, I'm looking for I don't see anybody waving any numbers at me, so I will proceed. <laughs> yes, but you see, the, that waving at the back presume that I'm not half blind, but I'm nearsighted. Okay, quickly, they. The Caribbean, given all that I've said that is part of context, the Caribbean has produced a number of important scholars who have reacted to that history. And we want to mention quickly just two of them, Franz Fanon and Wilson Harris. 
and Fanon sees the colonial relationship as establishing the Caribbean psyche, an existential deviation or zone of non-being, while Wilson Harris sees the trauma of colonialism to be read on the model of the voiding by consciousness and the transformation of the post-colonial ego as a precondition for post-colonial reconstruction. We wanted to combine our scholars, that is Fanon and Wilson Harris, with the, the work of Jack Lacan. And we wanted to do that because what Fanon and what Fanon and Wilson Harris is saying is that one outcome, one transgressive outcome of the tensionful conditions of and the displacement of the continuing, continually unfolding colonial situation is the paradox of a sense of inferiority and limitation alongside a rigid or extreme ego institutionalization that gives rise to the illusions of self-sufficiency and self-completion. And the work of Lacan takes this up in a more universal sense and also offers some indication of how we might overcome our situation. Lacan talks about three orders of the real, the imaginary, and the symbolic, and how they work together to create the tensions of our psychosocial cultural selves. He also offers a promise of functional, the functionally realizable, in which we can reinscribe the deficiencies to which the imaginary arises as a productive relationship with a non-alienative symbolic order. What we are suggesting, quickly, I got it. She, <laughs> she comes closer with the time up, so there's no escape. What we are suggesting, finally, is that we should see organizations in this, this imaginary sense as an exilic space, a place in which people can escape from the noisy sphere. But it must be an exilic space in which we attempt to integrate our fragments, to move from negativity to positivity without defensive compensatory mechanisms. Let us experiment with creating an organizational environment in which a bounded emotionality focuses on categorical respect and on a language and practice that moves beyond the post-colonial moment to a real fullness of engagement and productivity. Thank you. Another round of applause for Mr. Clement Branch, um, who really got us to think about the present, the effect of our past on our present. We really look forward to seeing that paper uploaded on the JBDC website because I know it will take quite a bit of study. Very useful information. At this time, we're going to welcome Ms. Sophia Morgan, organizational consultant and lecturer of the University of the West in is Mona Campos. And she's going to be telling us a bit about identities and identification in a post-colonial organization. A round of applause for Ms. Morgan. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I was asked to show how my study on identities and identification in a Jamaican company relate to the topic of employee engagement. I sum this up in two words. It's complicated. 
we're asking of individuals in a society who are struggling with inherited deficits of a colonial past, struggling with notions of who they are to invest themselves in the organization. But how do I invest myself when I'm not even sure of myself? Let me take you briefly through my study to explain what I mean. I'm going to start by explaining the main terms. So, OK. What do I mean by identity? Identity is the various ways a person or a collective or a group define who he or she or that entity is. So in this study, I'm highlighting four types of identity. Individual identity, and that's personal identity, and that relates purely to the person or the individual. I'm also highlighting the identity of the organization, which I call the collective or the corporate identity. Um, and I'm also highlighting two other types of identity, role identity and group identity. The role, those are the roles of the group and the individuals as well. So the individual performs a role, but the role is created and managed by the organization. And similarly, the group identity is enacted by the individual, but it is managed by the organization. So role and group identity are shared by the company, and you have the individual, which is a personal identity, and the organizational identity, which is a corporate identity. And all of this define who am I or who are we. So identities become aligned in the process of identification. So through identification, a company and its employees, who are the individuals, engage each other and hopefully, if the process is successful, uh, the individual identifies with the company, i.e., that is, he or she takes on attributes of the company to define his or herself. The other term I want to explain is the post-colonial society. Mr. Branch did that in detail, but for me, I use the post-colonial society as a context for this study because it is about recognizing that the legacies of our colonial past are impacting us in ways that are stifling our process progress as a nation, as organizations, and as individuals today. So coming out of our colonial histories, individual identities are fragmented, they're unstable, and we need to transform them in ways that we think about ourselves um, that tie, tie us to our colonial past. In other words, we need to create positive images of ourselves that are strong enough to deny the images given to us historically and develop rituals that are continuously affirming these positive images and identities. The post-colonial organization is embedded in the post-colonial society and it reflects and responds to this society. So we recognize that the organization was a colonial instrument of power and in the form of the plantation. So work organizations today have inherited these structures and are experiencing much difficulty in transforming them. I'm saying that the post-colonial organization attempts to attend to those colonial deficits in a way that transform these identities and build productive organizational lives. Uh, just quickly, um, a little bit on the methodology and the conceptual framework of my study. This is a qualitative case study in a Jamaican company. I interviewed 38 persons. 10 of those interviews were with the executives. I wanted to know about the company's identity, so I call those spokesperson interviews, and 28 of these were with staff members throughout the company. There are also document reviews, um, company documents, company reports, and I was in the company for over, well over a year, where I observed the culture and what was going on. 
The framework here implies that both the individual and the organization are separate entities. And when they come together, the coming together is about the aligning of, of identities. So my findings, I don't know if you can see the diagram well, but I will explain it. So I came up with six individual identity profiles to explain the personal identity. That represents what people want. So identity for me, personal identity for me are your desires, your concerns, the projects that you choose to pursue in life. So these on, I want to say my right, my left, security, mobility, <laughs> status, those, are, those represent the personal identity profiles. And the middle column represent what people desire. Now they relate to what they desire in the workplace, but they're also translated to what individuals de desire out of life in general. So in the third column, we see the organizational conditions that must exist to promote positive identification and hence employee engagement. So just to explain a little bit, when I'm focusing on coping day to day, that's security. If my profile at the time is about security and I call this person this moment a survivalist, um, I, um, my personal identity is salient. Now, if the company is responding to me in a way that I feel is uplifting, as it says there in the other column on the right, my right, um, I will invest myself and fully engage the company in terms of uh, achieving what they want. At another time, I may be focusing on mobility and my role identity is salient. So if I perceive that the company's policies and interpersonal structures facilitate opportunities for advancement, then I'm going to give my all. So you work hard or I work hard because I know the rewards of advancement are sure. So here is what a post-colonial society, sorry, a post-colonial organization looks like. It it is enveloped, enveloped, sorry, in the mission espoused values and the organizational practices um, of the company. Um, but we want to highlight three things or three elements of such an organization. There's a strong national ethos, a sense of contribution and nation building. There's also practices in the organization that encourage empowerment. So stratification is, an, is naturally how organizations operate. They operate in stratified ways. So we have roles ranging from CEOs to the ancillary staff. The point we're making here is that in spite of where you are in the company, everybody matters. So empowerment is about ensuring that everybody feels that they matter. Social affirmation is about building valued selves. So we want to affirm you as a human being and value your membership in the company. And we're saying as well that you're not alone. So that's what a post-colonial organization looks like. In summing up, how does this relate to, to organizational, to employee engagement, sorry. We're saying that there are multiple identities in the organization and it's important that they all align, they all become aligned to facilitate optimal engagement or optimal identification. So I know that we're talking about employee engagement, but I want to make the point that engagement is a two-way process. It is a negotiation process between the company and the individual. As my findings show, all identities need to be aligned. So employee engagement is a top-down process. The company is asking, what can we do to better facilitate an engagement? But I'm pointing out here that the company must also recognize that employees have a voice. They know what they want, and to engage them, 
we have to listen to them. So it's also a bottom-up process. I want to make the point to that engagement, we are appreciating that the organization comes, sorry, that the individual or the employee comes to the organization with a range of desires as indicated in the identity profile. So when we're thinking about employee engagement, we have to build multidimensional programs that take care of all of these desires. So finally, work productivity. Um, so the issue of work productivity, therefore, is about building productive organizational life via the development and transformation of identities. Productivity becomes a non-issue in a company that invests in building and transforming identities and providing a context for the alignment of identities and building productive organizational lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Morgan. Um, just reminding that the presentations will be uploaded onto the website. Hi, Harold. And you should be tweeting quite a bit right now. We've heard some very interesting information. So we do know organizations have multiple identities, such as group and corporate, and they do not naturally align. Thank you for that, Sophia. And enga employee engagement actually occurs when these identities are aligned, producing positive employee identification. So at this time now, we move into Dr. McClear's presentation, and he will tell us a bit about building trustworthy organizations, traditional and cultural factors within the Jamaican organizations. Let's have, give him a round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, nice of you to have me. Uh, this is a mini presentation. It's not a long presentation. I would have loved um, it if it could have been, but I'm limited. So work with me, all right? So I am here to make a presentation in regards to trust. T-R-U-S-T, -S -T, trust. And this presentation is really focused on my research work, which was to create a suitable measure, a suitable instrument of trust for Jamaica, and to thereby determine what factors employees would consider in trusting their organization. So the focus is really organizational trust. So you may say, so why is trust, organizational trust, important? Well, trust is important because it is a predictor of employee engagement. It is a predictor of employee engagement. So if you want to build employee engagement, then certainly you must build trust. Whether trust in supervisor, trust in organization, building trust. So let me give you a little bit on the research. So this is the outline. We'll flow in this manner, looking at Jamaica's goal, the trust project, putting a little definition to organizational trust, delving into the research methodology, and again, looking at the overall results. So Jamaica has some national goals. And we know and we understand that growing the economy is critical to Jamaica. We also know that increasing employment is also a major objective. Additionally, we want to have competitiveness in terms of our business, productivity. Now this requires highly motivated employees employees who are seriously engaged in the business. But I put it to you, we have not been doing a great job over the decades. We have not been growing the economy continuously. And many have done research and put forward solutions. It has been said that we need to retool. That's a common um, solution that has been put forward. The argument 
has also been advanced that we need to train our employees so we can get productivity improvement. But I say to you, what has not been popular in the dialogue is the building of trust. Not been popular. There, I have heard two mention, two occasions that it has been mentioned. And the Honorable Minister is not here. He has left, I take it. But I heard the Governor General and I heard the Prime Minister speak on two occasions. The Governor General at his throne speech and when the Prime Minister was being sworn in. They, they spoke clearly on trust, how important trust would be for Jamaica to actually grow the economy and to get us moving, get us off. But then I have not heard anything more in regards to trust from the national dialogue standpoint. When we look at the research in Jamaica in regards to trust, it is dismal. It's not a good thing. And there is much distrust in our society and even in our organizations, much distrust. And this would have a negating influence on employee engagement. There is worker demotivation. There is antagonism between trade unions and management. And there is low worker productivity. But if we are to build employee engagement and to grow the economy, then we certainly need to build trust. Trust in supervisor, trust in the organization. Very important. So what will make our workers trust their Jamaican employee? So follow me. Before we get into, I'm, I'm wetting your appetite. We need to do a little definition. What do we mean by trust? So trust is really having an assurance that someone that you depend on will do you no harm, will cause you no grief, will not fail you, will not behave in a way that is negative for you. But when you trust, you're actually making yourself become vulnerable to that person that you're trusting. Correct? All right. But when we speak of organizational trust now, Mayor Davis and Scorman definition is that it is an employee's willingness to become vulnerable to their organization based on the expectation that the organization will perform actions that are important to the employee regardless of that employee being able to monitor the organization. That is the definition of organizational trust. So it's trusting in your organization that your organization will do you no harm. So the goal of the project is, the trust project, is to create a model or a measure of trust for Jamaica and then to determine what are the factors that employees would consider in trusting their Jamaican organization. Now, there are persons who took umbrage to that fact when we started out. And they say, why am I doing this and specializing in Jamaica? Um, what is so unique about Jamaica. But Jamaica has some uniqueness based on the post-colonial environment, based on our history. And we are an island that has some serious trust issues. 
When you look at the studies in America, the Western world, Europe, they focused on three critical factors. Ability, benevolence, integrity, or you can translate it competence, goodwill, integrity. But our thinking was if Jamaica has some uniqueness in terms of our history, then possibly those variables may be important, but there may be other variables that are also salient. And so we started off doing some qualitative work, focus group discussions. Thereafter, a measure or model was created. So looking at the research methodology, we did three major studies. Three major studies. Study one, we surveyed 653 employees across six organizations. And study two now was a two-part study. So study two, we surveyed 1,174 employees in eight organizations across four industries. And the second part of the study was a longitudinal study in a company that was undergoing a partial change in ownership. And the third study was a comparative study um, of a bank and a utility company. So what were the results? All right. So this is it, ladies and gentlemen. This is the model and measure of trust. And we are prepared to give you the paper that was presented so you can speak with the organizers and we can send it to you, all right? But what we're saying is simply this, that there are six major factors for trust. Ting your organization. Is the organization competent? Does it have the ability to wade through the challenges that exist? Does it have goodwill? Does it demonstrate benevolence to its employees? Is it a caring organization, organizational goodwill? Integrity, does it say it will do something and, do, and it does it? And then the two critical and salient variables from a Jamaican standpoint, which I know will resonate with you all it will reverberate, it is justice and respect. So, is it that the organization respects its employees? Is it a just organization? So organizational justice and organizational respect are two critical variables to lead employees to trust their organization, along with the competence, goodwill, and integrity that is normally found in first world countries. Well, probably I shouldn't say that, uh, Mr. Branch. But the other variable that we must take into consideration is a psychological or personality-based variable. It is your, um, your propensity to trust. Because we are all... <laughs> I thought I would have beat the time, man. <laughs> we are all, we all have a propensity to trust. And so this is also critical. So in closing, respect and justice are important cultural factors for employees to trust. Supervisory trust is also critical because as supervisory trust increases, then organizational trust increases, which suggests that you must be careful who you put in a supervisory position. We also found that employee personality is important with supervisory trust. The more neurotic an employee is, then the less likely they will trust their supervisor. But respect is the greatest predictor of organizational trust. And finally, some demographic variables. Length of tenure in an organization will actually increase organizational trust. 
Role tenure, the longer you spend, keep an employee in his job, in a particular job, um, their trust will be eroded in the organization. And role and job, the higher up you go in an organization, the more you trust. And in terms of education, the more educated you are, then the greater your trust propensity. Milady, thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Dr. McCary. Um, what is clear from your studies, the trust model, competence, goodwill, integrity, and very importantly from, for Jamaicans, we want justice and respect you. So it's very real for us. Dr. Hoplin Hines will be looking at an investigation of the influence of leadership engagement and the perception of leadership engagement on employee engagement and performance in an organizational setting, a Jamaican case study. Hoplin, fear not. Good morning, everyone. First of all, let me commend you. It's, it's very encouraging to see so many persons willing to invest a day in finding out how they can better stimulate, inspire, empower, and engage their people. So there is hope for us yet. So I'm going to share a few insights about my study. My study really is a study of perceptions. Perceptions about leadership engagement and how it influences employee engagement and performance in an organizational setting. So the background to this study really has to do with relevance to Jamaica. Throughout the years, I've worked at several organizations and everywhere has been very engaged about studying engagement of their employees. But you rarely hear any focus on leaders. How are leaders engaged? Is it any different? Is it the same thing? And so that's what piqued my interest into looking into this topic. Additionally, several of our Jamaican writers have indicated that our Jamaican firms comparatively have lower productivity levels. There's also that post-colonial theme that we heard going through the previous presenters' presentations, and it speaks to the whole matter of languishers and flourishers. We are products of a post-slavery society, and the, the literature tells us, the Caribbean literature, that there, there's a concept that many people are languishing. Do we have any languishers here this morning? <laughs> Do we have any flourishers? Okay, wonderful. So the, the concept behind the languisher is that they're failing to make progress. Not Naguan, in terms of how the Jamaicans would talk. And for the flourisher, there is hope, they're aspiring to something, things turn up, right? And how does engagement fit into that? So part of the objective was to see if engagement can be a lever to help us transform some of our languishers into flourishers. And this was particularly important too in the context of this hyperdynamic world that we're in. Jamaica, in terms of things to do with our country, we're actually competing globally, as you know. Things are ch changing very rapidly, and the competition is fierce. We're not just competing with our local rivals, but across the global stage. And so in this fast-paced technological world, people have the same labor resources, same technological solutions. What is going to make the difference? What will be the differentiator? And the idea was perhaps engagement can 